Welcome to episode 31 of the Cycling Europe podcast. My name is Andrew Sykes. Now, before we get started with the main business of episode 31, I have a favour to ask. I'd like to start including a short monologue in future episodes of the podcast, all about someone's experiences of cycling in a particular European country. The monologue will be delivered by the person themselves. You might live in the country or you might have visited on your bike. If you're interested in helping out and contributing, then please email podcast at cyclingeurope.org for more details. Tonight I'm staying at a place called Catgill Farm, which is very close to Bolton Abbey. You can hear my brakes. And it is full of tents. God, that looks my perfect kind of campsite. For um, one night for two people. Um, okay. We're arriving separately. That's alright. Uh, what name is it under? Uh, Sykes. Okay, good. So I've got one adult here for one night. Yeah. So you haven't got a car with you, that's good. Yeah. So I'll just give you this one. So that's for your tent, so if you just wrap that around the rope on your tent. Yeah. Uh, it's just a sticker. Um, and then that is a COVID information sheet, just about our facilities and our rules and stuff when you're in there. Okay, yeah, no um, problem. Okay, so you're on a grass pitch, so you can pitch up anywhere on the two fields. Yeah. That was me checking into my first campsite last summer as I set off to cycle to the four capitals of the United Kingdom at the start of what was to become the Great British Cycle Tour. You heard the receptionist there mention Covid. It was, of course, the first summer of this global pandemic. And although travelling around the country was not just permitted but positively encouraged by the government, Covid restrictions did make life on the road a bit more inconvenient than normal. I stayed in campsites for almost all of the journey from Yorkshire to Edinburgh, but I did need to book most of them in advance, and social distancing was quite strictly enforced. As I continued my journey to Belfast, then Cardiff, and then London, I continued to camp where I could, but I also made use of the accommodation-sharing website Warm Showers, a few hotels, the spare rooms of friends, and a couple of YHA hostels. Despite the Covid epidemic, it wasn't such an untypical cycle touring holiday. You can, of course, watch the film of that round Britain adventure by visiting the Cycling Europe YouTube channel. I think it's fair to say that most people, me included, thought that come the summer of 2021, life would have returned to some kind of normality. Most people now, including me again, are a little less sure. If everything goes to plan, Covid restrictions will be lifted here in England on Midsummer's Day. That's June 21st, of course. But will that mean a return to life as it was pre-Covid? That seems very unlikely. It's therefore perhaps as good a time as any to investigate the options that are open to cycle tourists when it comes to accommodation. And in this episode of the podcast, I'll be doing just that, speaking to a man who has just opened a hotel that's specifically aimed at cyclists and walkers, the Youth Hostel Association of England and Wales, and an avid wild camper. But to begin this episode of the podcast, we're heading once again to Boulder, Colorado. We were last there in episode 25 when I chatted with the filmmaker Ryan Van Duza. Boulder is also home to the cycle touring accommodation sharing website Warm Showers and Tarverly Anglin is the woman in charge. So my name is Taver Lee, which is kind of an interesting name. I get a lot of variations of that pronunciation. So those that want to reach me and don't know how to say Taver Lee, they can call me T. I'm always good with that. And I'm the executive director at Warm Showers. I've been with the organization for who two years, two years and a bit now. I believe it's been two years. It feels like time flies by. 
And I'm actually a part-time contractor for the organization. So I'm not an employee. I'm a contractor. And I absolutely love what we do at this organization. So I would say that I'm the woman behind the scenes that makes everything come together and operate the way that it is. I just wanted to ask you about your name, in fact. You mentioned it yourself. Where does that come from? What's the origins of your name? I've never heard it before. Yes, I am definitely one of a kind. <laughs> um, my parents were hippies when I was born. And, you know, I grew up in Colorado. And most people know Boulder, Colorado. That's where I was born. My sister's name is Sunshine, if that tells you anything about my parents. <laughs> does the name Tarvali have a particular meaning? No, I I think that my parents wanted something unique and they were looking for something to express how they felt at the time. And so they created this combination of letters, which funny enough, it, I, I am quite unique in a lot of different ways in the different things that I do and always have been in my life. So I feel like they kind of forecasted the fact that I was going to live this unique life. Um, but not not really. I, I They tell me I'm a love child. And so no kid really likes to hear that. So... <laughs> And are you, uh, this is a bit of a, a loaded question, but I'm, I'm hoping I know the answer, but are you a cyclist? I am. Yes, I'm a cyclist. Yes, I'm more of a casual cyclist. It's, for me, it's a way to escape and put the wind on my face and move my body and be in nature and connect with others. It's, it's a part of what I say. It's, it's my version of therapy. It's my version of being grounded. It's my version of releasing the constraints of what we do day to day. I mean, you and I are both sitting here, even though we're in different parts of the world, we're sitting. I sit for a, a lot of my day and I work a lot of hours. And so I feel like for me, cycling is definitely, it's the part of me that allows, like, it just feels freedom. It's just freedom for me. Have you been involved in cycle touring at all, or is that something that you, you have yet to discover the beauties of? I have yet to discover the beauties of, especially long tour, long touring cycling. I mean, I have so many connections in the area that I live. So if I need an overnight stay, I'm typically staying with friends and family. And yeah, I, I have toured a lot around the world with different projects and different work that I've done. A lot of humanitarian work from different parts of Africa to 16 different European countries. I've been all over the world with a variety of projects and have done a lot of work in the community, not necessarily on my bicycle, but I have experience the community aspect piece of it in different ways, which is what really attracted me to apply when this when this job opened in the first place was the idea of connecting all over the world on a shared love of something that's that's really freeing for everyone. For anybody who's never heard of warm showers, and I can't imagine there are many people who are interested in cycling, certainly cycling touring who aren't or who don't know about warm showers, but let's imagine there are some people out there. Can you define what warm showers is what it does, and also how it, how it came about. What, what are its origins? Our mission is to promote and provide reciprocal hospitality for touring cyclists. And within, within that mission, our scope is really around providing the technology that allows touring cyclists to connect with hosts. And so users join our organization to either be a host or to be on tour, or oftentimes it's a mixture of both. And you know, our organization really started because there was a group of cyclists that were, were doing this. They were exchanging information on their trips. They were managing it in an Excel spreadsheet, and many of them were coders. So they started developing what is now the website that you see actually was originally started by a group of founders that had technology backgrounds that created a lot of the coding that we still actually have today, which is interesting if you think about it. And they were all volunteers. They built it up. And when it became too big for an Excel spreadsheet, they moved it into a database and then that database has continued to evolve where we currently have more than 185,000 registered users around the world. It is free to join uh, basically although you do encourage donations obviously like any organization it has costs to cover um, but essentially it is a free accommodation sharing website. Interesting that you say that Andrew. Um, about nine months ago, eight months ago we did roll out a one-time new user fee, but we grandfathered in everybody that had a current account. So anybody that had been registered with Warm Showers will incur no charges. They can access their profile free of charge. And what we did do is create a 30 US dollar one-time lifetime registration fee. And part of that was 
Actually, the majority of that was because we needed to build a sustainable model for how quickly we're growing. And our growing costs of technology continue to rise. And we do definitely accept donations. And this organization has, even with the user fee, we are still powered by the donations of our users. And if you think about this, to put it into perspective for you, less than 10% of our user base donates. So when you look at, you know, you, you, I'm sure have had lots of experience with different nonprofit models, right? What's, what's sustainable, what's not sustainable. And we know that technology for a nonprofit is super expensive. And so we run, we want, we run very lean as it is. And as our technology costs rise, we needed to put something in place that would allow us a more sustainable model to cover those costs and to continue to keep up with what technology is changing into and what our users want. So the organization itself, does it have a, an office? Does it have, you are a contractor, you obviously provide services to warm showers, but is it still essentially something that exists online in the ether? Yes, exactly. We are we're 100% digital, which is part of what I mean when I say we run a very lean um, organization. We don't have any overhead costs to what we do. I I work remotely. I work in various places. If I'm out riding, I'm still working. You know, I've spent a lot of time in the mountains. Our, and our board of directors are located all over the world. And so we are able to continue to do what we do built on this model of not having um, a physical footprint. We only work in the, I like how you say in the ethers. That's great. <laughs> and the people who originally came up with the idea, I think it was a couple of Canadians. Is that right? Um, I know that you mentioned that earlier. I, I actually am not familiar with who, the, who they are, the originals. I know the founder that our records dictate and who I've spoken to, his name is Randy Fay. Many of you will know him. He was around for a really long time. He sort of stepped from a volunteer into a paid staffing role at some point. And Randy did a lot of this. I mean, Warm Showers has built on the work of what Randy did. And I like speaking to him. It's been, you know, it's been quite a pleasure for me to see the work that he's done be carried on today, even if he's not involved in the organization. My research was done on Wikipedia. So uh, it could be it could be entirely wrong. But uh, there we go. Um, it's an accommodation sharing website. For me as a cyclist, I've signed up, I've paid my $30 as a new member. And how do I actually go about finding accommodation in the area where I'm going to travel? Yeah, it's super, super simple. And we have two ways people can access their profile now. We have a new app, an in-house app that we've developed that is an optional. It's, it is an upgrade. So there's a, a small monthly fee so we can upkeep the app. That's, that's an optional use of, especially when you're on tour, because it has a lot of cachet options when you're offline. But you can always access your account through your browser. And what you do is you log into your account and you're immediately going to have access to a map. And that map is going to reflect where you currently are in that moment. And it's going to give you a variety of other users that are located in that exact area that you're at. And all you have to do is click on that little pin you see on the map and you'll see a profile of another user come up and you can send them a message and say, hey, I'm 10 miles out. I'm, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be in the area around five this evening. You know, are you available? And it's as easy as that. We have a map with where people are located and you can also search by address. So if you can anticipate where you're going to be on your tour, you might say, oh, I, I anticipate I'm going to ride 20 miles a day. So a few days in advance, you may start, um, you know, you may start contacting hosts to see who might be available. And you might have to try a few because not all hosts are available all the time and send them an email and they come back to you. And, and that exchange, that exchange between someone on tour and the host is the crux of what we do. So our technology is constantly evolving to improve that process. And we get a lot of feedback from users around that. Like if there is ever a technical issue between that service of contacting a host, like that's our priority. That's where we put our time into because that's why people come to the site. That's why they become a user. And and then, of course, all the benefits of connecting with, with hosts and the community that's built is secondary. But the technology piece of how that operates is super important to us. And we were saying just before the podcast uh, started recording, uh, for me, one of the nicest things about uh, warm showers and what makes it far better than a site like, for example, um, couch surfing, is the fact that you meet people and you immediately have something in common with them because you're both cyclists. Usually you're both touring cyclists and there's immediately something that you can talk about. You can swap stories. And I think that is really 
what makes warm showers stand out from, uh, in inverted commas, the competition. Yeah, it's it's incredible. You know, you know, we have a podcast similar to to yours, and we have stories from the road that we share in our newsletter, and we have posts that go on our blog. And the most impactful part of this work with this organization is what happens when two people that are, or two families, or two individuals that are interested in in cycle touring connect. You know, through hosting or touring, it's it's amazing the type of impact it has on people's lives to meet others, especially if you're touring in another country in a different culture and you're experiencing life in a different way. And there's somebody that comes along your path and gives you a place to stay or tips on where to go. It's, it's life changing. And that fuels for all of us, for the board, for myself, those of us that do this work in the background, it fuels everything we do because we just know how impactful that is on someone's life. Has it been a challenge or is it a challenge to, maintain that original ethos of the organization uh, as a friendly non-commercial simple idea is that something that's increasingly difficult as you gain members as as the organization grows you said what 180,000 people now involved is 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 it quite a challenge to maintain that friendly ethos with so many people involved that's a really good question and it's it's something that we talk about often in our communications with our community because we know that the role that we fill in providing the technology for those connections to happen is is critical. And we actually don't have members, right? People are users. We, you're not actually a member of the organization. You just have a user account on our technology. We keep that end goal of everything that we're talking about in mind and all of the decisions we make, although this idea of reciprocal hospitality is reflected in the way that this organization operates. There's a lot of challenges that come with that. One of them is that in different parts of the world, there's not the same type of nonprofit model that there is in the United States because warmshowers.org foundation, which is our um, true name is a, a registered nonprofit organization in the U S and other parts of the world don't necessarily understand what that means. In fact, there are some countries that can't donate to a, a U.S. based nonprofit organization because of their own country's restrictions on what classifies a nonprofit organization. So sometimes that, that ethos of us bringing in and becoming sustainable, needing resources to provide that technology, how that relates to what users know about how the operations go is, is sometimes just not always understood. So I would say that that sometimes is difficult for people to understand the method behind what we do always comes back to it, right? Like our vision is to have a, a long-term future where everyone everyone has the opportunity to tour and connect with a host along their path. I mean, our goal is, you know, millions of connections possible through Warm Showers technology. So we hold that vision very, very closely. I think that any of the questions that have come up around you know, promoting free reciprocal hospitality because we've added this new user fee in has come up, you know, as a question, is is, is it free? Well, you know, hosts are not allowed to charge, so it's still free for touring, touring cyclists. And, you know, we don't ever anticipate that we are a person's entire package of their tour, right? Most people have other options along the way. They might have a hotel, they might camp, they may stay at a hostel. You know, we we fill a part of their role. You know, we have never really seen ourselves as being able to plan your entire trip and rely entirely upon warm showers for all of your trip planning. We're just a, we fill a role within that. And that ethos still is the same. You know, reciprocal hospitality is um, is the core of what we do, even if we need to have reserves to keep that technology possible for that to happen. Yeah, and that, that's actually an interesting point you make about mixing it up with other forms of accommodation, um, because I, I, I think hand on heart, I wouldn't want to stay with other people every single night of a trip. I think it's nicely exhausting when you do it, but uh, after you cycle for a long distance, you meet people, you you have good conversation, you might have something to drink, something to eat, and it's a it's a good social event. But it would be like having a social event every single night of the week, and I think it's quite useful to mix it up with other things as you're travelling. And some nights you might just want to kind of put your tent up and just speak to nobody and and uh, eat your whatever, and then <laughs> head off to sleep. Um, if I or when I speak to people about warm showers, they are universally supportive. They are they think it's a fantastic thing. However, the complaint that people have 
I don't want to overemphasize this because I think it's a small complaint compared to the the massive advantages of using warm showers is the fact that the the database sometimes appears a bit out of date in that you'll contact somebody and you won't get a response and you sometimes feel mm, should that person still be on there should that person have been kind of filtered out at some point because I'm not getting a response and it's kind of I'm, I feel as if sometimes I'm wasting my time is that something that warm showers as an organization can address or is that simply the nature of the the kind of um, organization it is well yes and yes <laughs> we you know we we could address it in certain ways and I'll explain what we've done to work on that issue and it is the nature of the organization right we don't we don't monitor hosts profiles we don't monitor you know who you are and how often you respond we you know we don't you know, we don't provide that type of service. But what we can do is have the map that you look at reflect only users that have logged in in the last 12 months. Like that's, we made that big change last year and it, it filtered out a lot of hosts that have been inactive. You know, previous to me being with the organization, there was a lot of purging that happened of users. So if you didn't log in, if you did not respond to requests within 12 months, we would give you a couple of you know reminders, you know, update your profile if you want to stay a part of it or we're going to remove you. And what happened is there was a large majority of people that wanted to be a part of the community, even if they weren't touring and hosting. So we stopped sort of like this permanent removal of users. And what we did is take them off of the map. And so that's a process that we're still refining. And that's a, a process that's going to become really important as we're going into a phase of evaluating and upgrading our technology, which is going to happen in the next 12 months. We want to have that be even more refined. We know that it's one of the most common, um, I don't even want to say complaints, but just feedback from those that are on tours that they're, they don't get responses from hosts. And you know, our technology right now does not allow us to specifically only create a host account or just a touring account, right? It's up to you as the user to check at the box of what you're currently doing. And if you don't update it, you might appear as a host, even if even if you only hosted during one month when you're on vacation and you haven't gone back to hosting again. If you haven't updated your profile, we're relying upon this like 12-month timeline to remove you off, off the map. And of course, as often as possible, we remind our users through our newsletter, please update your profile. <laughs> please let people know if you're available or you're not. So those that are on tour are, are truly accessing available hosts. So yes, we, we understand that challenge and how we can best handle that on the technical side, because that's our role. How we can best handle that is always, it's in evolution all the time. It, in fact, I would say that it's probably one of the outside of having access to the apps that's probably the second most important topic of conversation that we have behind the scenes on how to refine that process. And anybody that's listening, if, you, if you've experienced that, just know we hear you, we're working on it, and hopefully our future technology will allow us to you know, really hone that down for available hosts even more clearly. And it might be a result of a rating system or a reservation system and a certain number of um, unresponses just automatically make you unavailable. I mean, there's lots of there's lots of options. Those are just a few off the top of my head, but there's lots of ways that we can work on that. As, a, as an advert for um, hosting, I like hosting just as much as I like being hosted. I I can't imagine using the th uh, warm showers without ticking the box which says yes, of course I'll I'll host other people. The irony is for me personally is that I used to I used to live down south in England in a place called Reading. And because it was halfway between London and Oxford, I used to get people visiting all the time. Um, and it was really nice to have these regular people once every few weeks in the summer, people would contact me. I now live in a far nicer part of the country, but it's a bit out of the way. And I'm not on an obvious uh, route. And I think I've hosted one person in the last couple of years, which is a real pity. So, But hosting is, is, is really good fun. And it's um, if you've been at work all day and then you meet one of the people who is cycling in the evening... It's just a really nice thing to do. It's a very relaxing way to spend the evening and um, kind of get engaged in cycle touring again without actually having to get on your bike. So, um, no, I'm a, I'm a real fan of, uh, of hosting. The, the C word cannot go without being mentioned, COVID. How has that impacted on, on warm showers and how do you think that will impact over the course of the next 6, 12 months? Mm, good question. Well, we know that long tour cycling is is obviously restricted in a lot of parts of the world 
And yet, most of our users are finding creative ways to stay on their bikes. We hear stories, I mean, literally every single day, either in my inbox or in my social media, I hear a story of someone that's doing something in a unique way. We have so for example, we have lots of hosts that have contacted us and said, hey, can you create a whole change in your website that allow people that have just outdoor space that can be available to somebody that's touring? Can you like create a whole new space so we can create that category so those that are touring during a pandemic know what's available? Of course, it's difficult for us to build that out in like you know short term. But the idea that there's ways to still be on your bicycle and connect in a socially distanced way, that that has always been the case since the beginning of the pandemic. What we're not seeing is necessarily, right, like overseas, as much overseas travel or, you know, cross borders. And in some cases, that's opening up now. We, you know, we were we were concerned, right, for our our cyclist community, um, even just the connection piece on how important it was. So what we did is is take advantage of the time where things may have been a little bit slower to, you know, do an evaluation of where the organization is. We dove deep into our, this is just giving you some operational pieces of what does the organization do when there's not as much touring. We spent a lot of time on our developing our strategic plan. We are looking deeply into our technology. And of course, we launched and worked on the apps during that time. So for us as an organization, it gave us a little space to do some of the projects that had been on our list for a little while. And our community has been fantastic. The sharing of ideas, you know, we created new forum sections for people to ask for writing connections or route information because people's plans, most of them changed. And one of the other things we did is really increase the amount of sharing of stories through our podcast and through our newsletter. So people that aren't touring have the ability to stay connected to other people's stories and and just be on the journey and share their their story. And, you know, we opened up the podcast to any submission. So anyone that feels like they want to talk about their tour or they want to share their experience as a host, that we can continue to have our community be connected in different ways. And one of the other things that we're doing in that area is – developing more partnerships with other like-minded organizations, touring organizations, biking organizations all over the world to continue to foster that community piece while people are still not having access to travel. Where do you see warm showers in five years or 10 years? If you're, if I kind of transported you to 2000 and what are we now, 2021, you're in 2031. Uh, What does warm showers look like? Great question. And we talk about this, right, on our strategic planning process. We talk about this a lot. I see the most important piece being excellent technology, up-to-date, excellent, streamlined technology. So you as a user can very easily access what you need when you need it at any time. Like excellent technology would be the goal for the organization. And I also see that the priorities of the organization, because we're pretty tech-heavy in the work that we do right now as an organization – that we switch that to be more partnership building, more community sharing, and have the technology piece be flawlessly running while we can focus more on the community piece. So I see that that transition will take place in the next five to 10 years, which is super exciting. And that's that's really what everyone is, is, is here for. Do you think there's a, a limit to the amount of growth that warm showers can experience? Do you think it will get to a point where it might get too big if for example, I don't know, if you had half a million, a million people, is there a, a maximum number that you think, mm, that's comfortable, we can we can deal with that, but beyond that, it's going to become a bit unwieldy? I'll answer that in, in two pieces. Number one is, is our technology capable of handling that type of growth right now, number one? And then number two is, do we have the resources to facilitate that? Because the more users that join Warm Showers, right, the more help desk tickets we get, the more questions we have, the more posts people would like on the forums, the more, the larger the Facebook group grows, right? Like all all the capacity grows. And so our goal is, yes, our techno- technology is being built in a way that we will be able to handle that type of growth. We anticipate being to half a million in five years. We anticipate, you know, if you if you want to project 10 years out, for sure we will have a million users. And so as much as we can automate that system and yet still have that personable, like the, the Taver Lee being available to respond to your email when you invite me on a podcast, like making sure that we still have the personnel to support what the community needs, um, it really just means building better, faster, more reliable technology. That's the capacity piece that we need. And 
holding that vision, right, of 10 years from now being from behind the scenes, less technology focused and more community focused, that means working with more partners, right, to develop what's possible. You know, I've, I've talked to a couple of very large bike touring organizations, some you will have heard of, and we've even talked about creating like a, a consortium of organizations like ours that do this work to come together to really share so we can grow together. And so I think that that's about capacity, right? Capacity is, is not necessarily staying in the silo. It's everybody branching out to support each other in the ways that we can. And that might mean some new map integrations. It might mean some new nonprofit organizations that facilitate um, different types of hosting, right? Like there's, there's lots of ways that we can build that community piece. I think that we have the capacity to grow. But the second part of that that I wanted to mention, because that was part one. So the part one is like, what is our capacity to be able to manage that? Part two is, are the numbers as important as the reliability of the information? So having a million registered users doesn't mean we have a million available hosts, right? It, it doesn't necessarily mean we have a million active touring cyclists and hosts. So I think that it's more important to us that we create the technology that allows it to be accurate, live, current information as opposed to the numbers that we reach. So I suspect that as we continue to grow, that's always going to be the constant balance of if you're touring this year, but you don't tour for five more years, how do we continue to engage you in the organization, but not necessarily let that take up space, time and resources of the organization. So though that's the balance, that's the balance that we're looking at. And we know that the re reliability of the data is more important than the quantity of users. Okay, finally, let's imagine I'm a, I'm a novice touring cyclist. I'm just beginning to kind of explore the world of my bike and I'm looking at accommodation options. Yeah, I want to do a bit of camping. I might occasionally stay in a hotel if I'm kind of cold and wet and just kind of feeling in a miserable mood. But I'm also looking at warm showers. Can you sell warm showers to me in, in a few sentences, in 30 seconds? Sell you warm showers in 30 seconds. Yes. I would say if you are looking to have connections along your path and experience the local community of the areas that you're going to be in, contact a warm showers host, even just once, even twice, allow someone in that area to give you feedback and receive you and host you and allow you the opportunity to connect with someone who not only understands what it's like to be on tour, but can provide you with local culture and flavor. It would be, it would it will change your trip and your journey to connect into the community that way. Yeah, that, that is so true, isn't it? I mean, now I, I think of the trips I do when I'm not on the bike and I'm not using warm showers, and it's almost a bit frustrating that you don't have those opportunities to meet those local people, to interrogate them in a nice way about their place, where they live, where to go to eat, where to cycle or where to travel to. Yeah, I think that, that, local, that local knowledge is, is second to none. Yeah. That's why our hosts are so critical to this organization, because they provide such wonderful experience for our cyclists. It's not just about a place to sleep or, you know, being able to exchange a meal. It's having connection to the local community is 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 very impactful. OK, well, that's that's excellent. Uh, thank you for talking to me and, uh, you know, good luck in your travels for 2021. And uh, let's hope we're all back on our bikes uh, exploring the world very, very soon. Yes, thank you, Andrew. Thank you for having us and taking the time to get to know a little bit more about warm showers. We appreciate it. Tarvali mentioned hotels, hostels and camping, and that's where we're going next. If you find yourself in Scarborough this summer, you might want to investigate a new hotel called Bike and Boot, which opened its doors, then closed them again in 2020. I spoke to Simon Kershaw about the cycling-friendly hotel and his plans to reopen once restrictions are eased. I'm Simon Kershaw. I'm one of the founding partners of a new rural leisure brand called Bike and Boot Hotels. What makes Bike and Boot so different from your, dare I say, box standard hotel? Well, we have tried to create something that's sort of fit for purpose for people today. We have a, a secure room where you can padlock your bike to a frame, a framework that's built into the building. It's CCTV'd. You can only access the, the room that it's in with your key card, so only guests can get into the room. We also then have a, a service area. So we've got a cycle tower, a, a service tower, which has all the different spanners, screwdrivers, all the bits and pieces you need to, to tweak your bike. It has uh, an air pump. 
we have a, a bike wash area. So if you've been mountain biking or you've been out and it's been a bit muddy and messy, you can clean your bike down. So rather than having to take your bike in a room, leave it in the car or put it in a shed somewhere, you have almost cycle store type facilities that are there for your use. There's no charge for that. It comes all, all as part of your, your room price. And we think that that's really important for cyclists. We have facilities for dog owners. We have a, a grooming room with a professional dog bath, grooming table, dryers. We have drying room for all the walkers. And our hotels are predominantly going to be based in rural locations where people can immediately access, be it walking, you know, cycling, mountain biking, road biking. Uh, we started off with Scarborough, uh, which we opened last year and uh, we're about to reopen May the 17th. We are very informal. In our lounges, our guests help themselves to hot drinks. You just help yourself, it's all included in the price. We bring cake out in the afternoon, so if you've been out exercising, you can come back and have a lovely big piece of cake. Uh, we don't have smart receptions, we have automated check-in, you can check in and out on your phone. So it's a very informal base, and if I were to describe it, it's a cross between Hotel Devant and Premier Inn. So that, I think that kind of gives you a feel of what it's like. Where did the idea originally come from? Well, my business partner and I have been in the hotel and hospitality industry for a long time, at all ends of the market, from five star through to budget. And we felt there was a gap in the market for a rural leisure brand, somewhere that people who spent increasing amounts of time walking, cycling, or just going away to have a couple of nights and relax, that there was a, a gap there for a hotel that serviced that sort of community. Is there a type of cyclist that you, you are interested in, or are you on offer to anybody who comes and knocks on your door? We don't have any particular cycling group that we target. Uh, we have road bike cyclists, we have mountain bike, gravel cyclists, uh, in fact, we also hire out electric hardtail mountain bikes and we'd no idea how popular they'd be. Uh, and in fact, our first couple who hired the bikes thought they were road bikes and they were serious road bike cyclists, were horrified when they were electric, went out for the day and came back about 12 hours later with a big grin on the face saying, we've got to buy one of these. Um, so anyone who even wants to come away and thinks, do you know what, I wouldn't mind hiring a bike and just doing some forest trails or just pottering around the roads, they can do that. So it's really open to all, all shapes, sizes, speeds, distances, types of bike. You know, it's, it's about people coming out and enjoying themselves and being able to share an environment with people who also like getting out in the countryside. Yeah, and a slight advert for Yorkshire, you're based in Scarborough, your first hotel is based in Scarborough, and actually that's a cracking area to come and cycle. I was there a couple of years ago, I was cycling along the, the Cinder Track, the North Sea Cycle Route it is, um, that goes through Scarborough. So there is a lot of opportunities for cycling in that particular area. Yeah, so you've got, you know, the, the Tour de Yorkshire, you've got, of course, the Tour de France was the, was the real big one. But you can come and you can do all kinds of routes. You can either do Tour de Yorkshire routes from Scarborough. You can do Tour de France routes. You could go up into the moors. The Dolby Forest has fantastic routes for all abilities. The uh, cycle centre there, you can hire bikes there. You can do a, a system where you can hire a bike there and you can be moved between the hotel and Dolby. There's coastal routes. There's, there's really everything. And that was what really attracted us because you can do your few days cycling or you can go down in the evening, go on the front and have a go on the 2P sliders and make your day. Now, I stumbled across your hotel online simply because I was doing a search for the scheme, which I think it's run by Cycling UK, which is Cyclist Welcome, which kind of makes a list of all the places that are cycling friendly. But your place stands out simply because you you don't just welcome cyclists, but you actually go out and, for goodness sake, it's in the name of your hotel, Bike and Boot. Do you know of any other hotels, either individual or chains, which are doing what you are doing, or are you a unique standalone operation? 
Well, of course, there are lots of, of B&Bs and, and pubs and, and hotel groups who uh, will welcome cyclists and you can take your bike into the room with you or you can put it in a shed or something. But to our knowledge, there's nobody that sets out to the degree we do to provide facilities as extensive as ours that are purpose made and built into the fabric and the purpose of the hotel existing. And, and that really, we understand, sets us aside. And in fact, we've had interest from both national papers in France and Germany uh, who have written about the, the brand saying, when are you coming to France and Germany? Because we think we know about cycling, but we haven't got any hotel that resembles anything like this. So, so you know, maybe we've struck lucky and hit on a theme that might just work. But you do have plans to expand within the UK, don't you? Yes, we're looking at, in fact, we've started building our second hotel in the Hope Valley in the Peak District, which will open next year, March 15th. Uh, we're working at planning stage on hotels in Sherwood Forest, uh, Forest of Boland. We're looking at Cotswold Lakes uh, near Gloucestershire the Brecon Beacons. So we have about eight or nine sites that are in, at a planning stage at the moment. And the idea is that people will be able to go to the different hotels in the different area. You'll know what you're going to get and you'll, you'll know what to expect. And it, it'll be quite fun just to almost tick them off as you go around and, and you know, spend your time cycling and walking. And I'll be honest, when I first looked up your hotel and looked at the website, I thought, wow, this is kind of top end stuff. And I'm sure if I came, I could spend a fortune if I had the money uh, in terms of being wined and dined in some of your best suites. But you mentioned before we started recording, actually, it's not that expensive at the basic budget end. It is relatively inexpensive for a hotel. Yeah, I think I think that there's a misconception. People go, what star are you? Well, we're not. And they say, what's your demographic? That's a favourite thing that everyone quotes at me. And I go, we haven't got one. Because you can come and stay in one of our smaller rooms for £65 a night, room only. Or you can stay in a grand suite overlooking the coast for £180. But the thing is that our small room still has interactive TV. It still has a proper coffee machine, a fridge, a mini bar, a room safe, a power shower, a double bed. So the only difference really is the square footage of the room. So if you've been out doing your exercise all day and you come back and you just want a bed to crash in, then a 65 pound small room is perfect. Whereas if you come back on another occasion and you happen to treat the, the wife or the girlfriend or whatever, uh, you can stay in a, a lovely suite and uh, you know spoil yourselves. But food wise, we're, we're very simple. We're very Mediterranean. Pizza, pasta, grills. Uh, we do a, a range of small plates, which is like tapas. Uh, we do lots of cake. Cake has proved to be incredibly popular. So lots of coffee, cake, cocktails. So it's about somewhere where you can go and have fun and not have to worry thinking, well, I'm going to pay for this for the next six months. You might pay for it after the cake, but not, not the money. Yeah, that's kind of the, that's the holy grail of cycling, isn't it? A bicycle cake and coffee it's the the three things that go together what are your plans for reopening of the next few months then during the reopening period for covid well we we are aiming to reopen on may the 17th if everything goes to plan uh, i think covid wise obviously we everyone got used to it in the last last summer when we opened in july and we were open to the end of october so the staff and our systems and processes were, were developed and, and honed then. And we're pretty much going to stay with, with that. So, you know, six, the, the groups of six, the social distancing, the masks, the sanitation, the deep cleaning of the rooms, be it the, the public rooms or the, or the bedrooms. And I think that a lot of the things that we've adapted during COVID will stay with us forever now, I think. In winter, people will wear masks when they go into public places. Uh, I think that the certainly the hygiene uh, standards that have been introduced in hotels and pubs and restaurants, cafes, I think they're with us for good because they, they make sense. So we're taking every step we can to make sure that our guests feel safe and are safe, but also our staff because they're every bit as important to us as, as, as the people who stay with us. 
You mentioned that you're reopening on the 17th of May, if everything goes to plan, hopefully it will. And on the 23rd of May, there's something called the Velo to Velo Sportive, which is taking place in Scarborough. Is that right? And I think you're involved in that. Yes, that, it's going to be uh, run from the hotel. Uh, it's a great event, actually. And, well, a great event. We've not actually done one, but I hope it'll be a great event. And it's open to all standards of riders. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're a, an international calibre or whether you're someone who just likes to, to huff and puff up a hill, as I do. Um, so that'll be our first proper cycling event. And we have quite a few cycle groups booked in throughout the summer, actually. Uh, groups of friends, you know, larger cycling groups who are coming from, from far and wide. And they're staying for one or two nights and mainly to access the routes that are around Scarborough. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that. And uh, I must say, last summer, it was a bit like Crufts meets Tour de France on a, a Friday night when everyone was checking in because there were bikes everywhere and dogs everywhere. And, uh, it was a great atmosphere. Yeah, it sounds a wonderful idea. And uh, next time I'm in Scarborough, I shall certainly look you up and, uh, and try and book myself in. So, yeah, well, good luck with the reopening and uh, hope you have a busy summer. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you. Bike and Boot is a new kid on the accommodation block. The Youth Hostel Association, in contrast, has been around for over a century and is still going strong. It's weathered many storms over the years, from world wars to foot and mouth disease. But for an organisation that prides itself on bringing people together to share their experiences of the outdoors, social distancing is a particularly bitter pill to swallow. Simon Ainley spoke to me about how the YHA works with cyclists and how the association will function post-COVID. I'm Simon Ainley and I'm YHA's Head of Capital and Revenue Fundraising and I'm also a cyclist. Right, well that's the key thing, you being a cyclist, because um, obviously we're talking about accommodation options for cyclists. Now, I'm quite a regular user of YHA hostels a lot of people probably aren't, and a lot of people have probably a certain image of a YHA hostel. And I think whenever I go to one, it's nothing like what probably most people think of it as. So can you perhaps start by talking about how the YHA hostels have changed over the course of the last 20, 30 years? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I've worked for YHA during those 20, 30 years, and, and things have come a long way. When I first started working up in Yorkshire, Chores were expected to be done by individuals staying to keep the costs down uh, and, and dormitories were the standard fare. YHA has worked extremely hard over the years to improve the quality of accommodation offered and invested huge sums of money, actually. Mm. Uh, and now we have ensuite accommodation, in fact, in many of our youth hostels, as well as traditional self-catering facilities as well. And of course, things that cyclists regard as essential such as drying rooms. So although there is a data perception of YHA, the reality is quite different and we've come a long way in a relatively short period of time. So in terms of cyclists, what particular accommodation do you aim at cyclists, as well as obviously the general public? But there are things that you do which I think are particularly useful for cyclists. Could you just talk through those? We've always felt that we were one of the natural places for cyclists to stay, whether they're touring or undertaking an event or uh, just out for the weekend uh, away in somewhere like close to me here in the Peak District. And um, we have always offered uh, cycle storage at every hostel and with support from the Department of Transport more recently, we've been, worked hard to improve the quality of standards at our hostels uh, for cyclists. So much better security. So cycle stores have improved lighting, improved locks. Uh, bikes are much more secure, recognising now that uh, the average bike, well, not the average bike, but many bikes can cost well in excess of £1,000. And, and they are people's pride and joy. So we, we're very conscious of security. In addition to making sure that they are uh, secure, we have uh, things like track pumps at all sites, toolkits available for people to borrow, and they're pretty comprehensive uh, park toolkits, so you can undertake some fairly major work if you know what you're doing to get you back up on the road again uh, or out on the trail uh, um, and 
to a bike shop if you need more professional assistance. Um, we have water refill stations uh, at all our hostels now. So literally, if you're running out of water, you're close to a hostel, just remember, ah, if it's open, I can pop in and, and we refill my water bottles. Uh, that's fairly standard at all of our sites now. And we have some extremely uh, knowledgeable staff who are very into the outdoors. And in terms of the accommodation itself, it's more than just um, dormitories, isn't it? You offer other forms of accommodation which might be more traditionally associated with uh, cyclists. Absolutely. It, it's always best these days because white chairs become so popular because we've worked hard to improve the quality that we have. Always best to book in advance on yha.org.uk. Um, and when people go onto the website, they'll see a huge spectrum of accommodation. So, as I mentioned earlier, we have ensuite accommodation at one end of the spectrum. You can still get a basic bed in small dormitory if you want that sort of experience. And that is a budget price. You know, it can be as cheap as £10 a night. But um, we've expanded our range of accommodation. We offer camping at many sites now. And we also have a range of what we call alternative accommodation, which are things like teepees, cabins, Arctic cabins. There's, there's a huge range of different types of accommodation. Something new we're experimenting with this year uh, our Airstream caravans, which people might be more familiar with uh, in the States if they've done any cycle touring over that neck of the woods. So we, we've got lots and lots of different types of accommodation. And of course, essential super hot showers, toilets, and then having a beer or a glass of wine at the end of the day's ride. Nothing nicer in a beautiful location. Yeah, hang on. You, you mentioned something. And I, what was the thing in America? Talk about that again, the, the, the thing. Oh, you're... right. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we've been innovating and, and developing alternative accommodation. So we, we started initially with traditional uh, cabins, which took two or four people, and we put them in the grounds of our youth hostels where we got lots of extensive space. And it's grown and grown from there. So we started experimenting with Arctic cabins, which would have a different variation. And then we've tried teepees. And we've got bell tents and this year we're trying for the first time airstreams. So airstream caravans uh, are something that have come over from the States and we are the first, I think, to get them pretty much in the UK. So if you can envisage uh, maybe 50s retro stainless steel tubular type caravan, you're not wide of the mark there. So go to yha.org.uk and you can check them out there and, and see them in there for glory. We're hoping they'll be ready. Uh, a few sites, we're testing them out this year, see how popular they are across England and Wales. And we're hoping to reopen subject to uh, no more restrictions coming our way, 15th of May. Yeah, I suppose that kind of accommodation is already socially distanced, isn't it? If you're staying in a camping pod and you're in your little bubble of people, could be your family, could be your perhaps you and your permitted number of friends however many friends it is nowadays and you stay in one of those options outside in a cabin in a what were they called again airstreams airstream okay i can kind of em envisage them but i'm going to go on the website and have a look but yeah that's suppose they are naturally socially distanced from other people they are and the pandemic's been hard for ihA we naturally offer social uh, communal accommodation self catering kitchens communal lounges so on and so forth and that's what many people really love about YHA, the fact that you can meet like-minded people, uh, other cyclists, other outdoor enthusiasts, share stories, talk about where you've been or what you're going to do, so on and so forth, pick up tips and ideas. People love that. But last year, when we did open for that short period during the summer holidays, it, it was a real challenge and people really missed that, uh, that interaction. But... With our alternative accommodation, uh, it does enable us to spread out into our grounds. I and mean, we've got many acres at some sites uh, and it's a great way for us to utilise those grounds. So they are naturally separated and people can split into their uh, social groups, as it were. And uh, people love it. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the quirkier, the better almost. People come back with stories to tell, you know, from epic trips that they've had. And it's something we're continuing to evolve. I'm going to play devil's advocate here because um, one frustration I sometimes have when I'm looking to 
perhaps visit a YHA place or a place where there is a YHA. And I think, ah, oh, beautiful, you know, excellent location for the, for the YHA hostel. And I look at the pictures and there's a load of grass outside. And then I look on the website and there isn't a camping option at the YHA hostel. Are there, are there things that are preventing you from embracing camping more widely amongst the hostels? There are, there are sometimes regulations that we're obligated to follow and, and local restrictions which impact on what we're permitted and allowed to do at a specific location. And I think we have to be sensitive to, well, in some instances, local people, uh, in some instances, not overcrowding particular sites and spoiling the experience for people. We do now provide camping in far more places than we did a decade ago. I think you'll probably find heading towards 50% of our network now we've got either alternative accommodation and or camping so it's evolved a lot a lot over the years and um, again so check on our website Um, if we don't offer it we might be able to offer a recommendation to you somewhere locally that does offer camping so we want to keep people happy and make sure they have a great trip and hopefully remember oh those people at White Show were really friendly they gave us some great advice Okay, we didn't stay with them this time, but we might do next time. I I would imagine the Venn diagram of people who are both members of YHA and Cycling UK is uh, approaching a circle. They are people with similar ambitions when they head off on two wheels for their holidays. Absolutely. I, I can remember my father telling me he was a proud member of the CTC and a proud member of YHA. And when he was young, There weren't very many options for people uh, of his age when he was a teenager to get out from Yorkshire, where we lived at the time, where he lived as a youngster. Uh, And and so to go to the Dales or to go to the North York Moors or the Peak District, the only option for him really was to get on his bike and stay in a youth hostel. So membership of both organisations, I think, was extremely common a generation or two ago. Over the years, there have become far more options for cyclists. YHA is now working hard to, as I said earlier, make sure we've got the right facilities for cyclists. But those strong connections still exist. We still get an awful lot of cyclists stay with YHA. And I'm sure there are a lot of Cycling UK members and people who have a a strong affinity with cycling do, do come to YHA. It's interesting, we we launched our new strategy last year. And really front and centre of that is health and well-being of people and getting people outdoors. I think we all recognise with this pandemic that being cooped up inside is not good for people's health and mental well-being, particularly young people. And so we are really going to be working hard, as I'm sure many organisations, Cycling UK, every cycling organisation, to get people outdoors, get them active and, and get them into nature and enjoying and breathing fresh air. So we're looking to form those closer working relationships with organisations like Cycling UK and others to rebuild the nation's health and well-being, really, because it's taken a bit of a kicking over the past 12 months. And the more young people we can introduce to cycling, the more young people we can introduce to the outdoors. That's what we're all about, really. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of putting it mildly. It's taken a bit of a kick in. Yeah, it certainly has. Um, Just to finish with, um, you did mention COVID earlier in terms of the plans to reopen. If all things go to plan, then the government have said the 21st of June is the day on which all the restrictions will be lifted. Does that mean that YHA will return at that point to how it was pre-COVID or do you still envisage some restrictions being in place? That's a a really good question, Andrew. I mean, YHA is a pretty large organisation, really. So we're looking at a phased reopening of our network. We'll look to open our most popular sites first, get them up and running. But we've a lot of staff to bring back to work who've been on furlough for 12 months, a lot of training to uh, do with people to get them familiar with new ways of working, new systems. Because I I think we all recognise that although society might open back up to a degree of normality, there's going to be some impact for quite a long period of time. And so we need to be mindful of what that impact might be. It will impact on the opening and closing patterns of hostels. And I think it's going to take a period of time for people to gain confidence to come back outside again. You know, it's going to, it's going to take some time. So our opening patterns will reflect demand. 
Uh, we might do some exclusive hire of certain locations, locations that perhaps haven't been available on exclusive hire. So if you're in a cycle club and you're all in a, in a bubble or a group and you want a weekend away in somewhere um, like the Lakes or the Dales or Wales or wherever it might be, you know, you can hire a hostel in its entirety, which you might not be normally be able to do. So the key thing is to look at YHS website, look at what availability we've got and we hope that we will have a transition through to what was normal prior to the pandemic as soon as possible. But it's going to take us a bit of time to get there. Good luck when you reopen in the post-COVID world. Uh, let's hope things get back to some kind of normality sooner rather than later. Yeah, we're well, fingers crossed and, and we're hoping for a staycation boom. I mean, today looking outside, it's glorious. You know, the leaves are starting to uh, bud up and I'm hoping that there's a a surge of a feeling to let's get outdoors let's let's cast off the shackles of covid and, and get back out and yeah we're really hopeful that there is over the next couple of years going to be a boom in people staycationing having short breaks and and, and building back to where we were if staying with a stranger in their home or staying in a hostel or staying in a hotel or on a campsite doesn't take your fancy there is one more option before you head home. Wild, or as the Americans call it, stealth camping. Some people loathe it. Others love it. One fan is the long-distance cyclist, Tim Milliken. My name is Tim Milliken, and I'm best known for a cycle ride around the world from Reading, England, all the way to Reading in Pennsylvania. That was a journey of 46,500 kilometres taking three years and probably spent about 800 of those nights out of a thousand nights while camping so i feel like i'm pretty clear on precise on what the best things to do and not to do are when you are wild camping i am probably the world's worst wild camper when i set off to cycle across europe for the last time well the last time as in the most recent time uh, which is back in 2015 I had this plan to wild camp at least once in in every country, and it never happened. I just I just never feel comfortable wild camping. It's outside my comfort zone, and people like you amaze me because you do it all the time, and you seem to do it without any problem whatsoever, and you don't seem in the least bit scared about doing it. Yes, and to think about the fear factor, Andrew, the interesting thing is that when I first started wild camping I was absolutely terrified of it I thought someone was going to break into the tent and attack me or I was going to be jumped on by a wild horse all these kind of thoughts went through my mind and it's only by doing it a lot you do develop that sense that nothing will hurt you nothing will come and get you in the night you're actually pretty safe and I guess you can increase your safety by just knowing what works for you and what doesn't work for you like personally i like to be quite hidden when a wild camp um, especially if i'm anywhere near a big urban center like a town or a city so i guess in terms of getting over the fear the important thing is practice i guess just the more you do it the more confident you will become generally i find that wild camping is actually quite a solo thing because you try and find a hidden spot you try and find uh, a spot that ticks all your boxes for me i'm looking for something that is quite remote is flat um is beautiful potentially uh is out of the wind maybe because i'm looking for somewhere i can have a good night's sleep so somewhere like in australia you can pull off the road go 200 meters into the bush and nobody can see you and it's flat and it's perfect but there are times when you do happen to stop and you might see another tent and a bike on the side of the road and you might fancy a chat with that person you can go in and say How's it going? But often I find wild camping to be quite a solo experience, especially if you are traveling alone. If there is more of you, obviously you can make a little campsite somewhere. Um, and that's a lot more social experience. But generally wild camping for me was a, a solo thing. And I got the social side from the things like the warm showers and the Casa de Ciclistas and the hostels. And that's where I could find the more social aspect of the trip. When you're camping in a campsite, you kind of 
my days would tend to be or tend to be if I haven't booked accommodation in advance you set off in the morning and for the first half of the day I just don't think about it I don't worry about it and then it begins to play in my mind later in the afternoon and then you know at some point I'll stop and look and find a campsite and sort something out and decide where I'm going to go and usually if you're a lone cyclist you don't need to book it in advance you can just rock up and mm-hmm. there there no problem if you're wild camping at what point do you begin to to look for accommodation? Do you wait until it's really dark or is that kind of too late in the day? So for me, um, one of the joys of wild camping is the freedom, especially when you're on a longer trip. You can kind of stop whenever you wish to. Because my trip had no definite end date, if I found a beautiful spot at two, three o'clock, I would go there and I would camp and have the afternoon and do some washing or or make a nice meal or and just enjoy it. But generally, if you're going forward and you're looking for a spot, I would say do it before it gets dark. There's nothing worse than putting your tent up and cooking in the dark. I'm very much a believer that I want to enjoy my camping as much as my cycling. So I will probably start looking around about, say it gets dark at six, I'd probably start looking around about four. Because it can take a while to find that perfect spot that ticks all the things you're looking for. You know, you don't want to be caught out with a spot that's not very good because you've rushed it and that does happen sometimes because either you're enjoying the cycling or you just don't find a spot that's adequate or safe or secure or what fits what you're looking for what you will find it's really interesting is every time you pick a spot to wild camp you'll find a better spot 10 kilometers down the road that you could have made but that's just part of the joy of wild camping and the freedom that it allows you to have one of the main reasons why i like a campsite is the fact that it has things there that you can use washing facilities and toilet if you're wild camping those kind of rudimentary necessities of life especially the toilet are not there how do you cope with that especially if you if you're in a more urban area you know what you need to really look for and think about is the principles of wild camping and a really key one is obviously to leave no trace and that, in, that includes the bathroom as well and your fire pits and all sorts of things like that. You don't want you want to leave it exactly as you found it. So if you are going to have a fire, I'll just talk about this briefly, cover it up with the, you know, with some pines or some ground afterwards. You don't leave a black mesh for the next person to find. Also, don't leave carrot peel or onion peel all around the campsite. You need to leave it as you arrive. And that's really, really, really important. And one of the fundamental rules of world camping. Also about going to the bathroom, if you do need to go for number two, you can get a really lightweight trowel to dig a hole with. And it's a really important tool to take with you if you are looking to wild camp. If you're going to campsites, you don't need to worry as much about that. But still, they're really lightweight and they've cost about a tenner. And that is the only way to make sure the, the area is left in pristine condition after you've been to the bathroom. Is it fair to say that it's easier to wild camp in a place that's more wild? And it's more difficult to wild camp in a place like Britain where, or even Europe more generally, where it's not actually that wild. If you go to Australia, if you go to South America, if you go to the Rocky Mountains, it's a lot more wild than you find in certainly in this part of the world. Yeah, I guess it is easier when the nature is more wild. It gives you more opportunity and you just find better spots more regularly. But it doesn't mean that you can't. I remember cycling through Wales once and I camped which is you know you think wow it's actually got a lot of green land around it but it's all owned by farmers and these sheep to have lots of sheep on it so the farmers often come around six seven o'clock to get the sheep in so it doesn't make a good spot for wild camping because you'll be spotted and you might ask questions and you might get moved on saying that i was once camping on a field in wales and the farmer came along in the morning in his in his little quad bike and he went past me and then reversed and i put my head out the tent it was like oh hello mate sorry i'm just cycling And he goes, oh, cool, no worries, and then headed off again, which was a really lovely moment. So you just have to be more creative, I guess, in urban areas as well. I mean, I remember camping once in Sunny Beach in Bulgaria, and it's a very, very touristy part of Bulgaria. Lots of nightclubs and people around going partying and things like that. Brits and all sorts of people go there. Um, But I found a little ledge that was maybe up high, so it was out the way of everywhere else put my tent there I could go down and enjoy the party scene and then come back up to my tent in the evening so yeah you just have to be a lot more creative and just you know probably as we said earlier maybe start looking a bit earlier for the right spot because they're going to be less available in urban areas and in western Europe as well. Apart from in Scotland and I think in the Lake District above a certain height 
it's not actually legal to do it in most of Britain. Is that something that you can happily ignore? Or will you have problems with the law in Britain if you do start wild camping in places where, strictly speaking, you shouldn't be wild camping? Yes, it's illegal in, say, in England and many parts of the world. It is illegal to wild camp, but that shouldn't really put you off. I mean, I wouldn't wild camp in somebody's garden. That's clearly not allowed. But if you're in a public area, you're out the way and tucked away, and it's only for one night. If you are setting up camp for a long time, you are going to get more questions. But we're just passing through. So as long as you keep the mentality that you leave in no place and you are passing through, you should have no problems with the authorities. Just make sure the land is clearly not owned by somebody. I remember once I was wild camping in America and I thought I was out the way, but it was kind of like a middle ground, but it was getting late. And I'd stopped on this ground and two American policemen turned up and said they've had reports of a homeless man camping on the land. And I was in my tent, it was about six o'clock and I hear the sirens come along. And the first thing they said to me was, sir, have you got any guns? And I put my head out of the tent and say, no, I'm English. And they went, all right, no problem. And they directed to me actually to somewhere where I could camp for the evening. But um, yeah, if you are out the way and you are looking after yourself, looking after the environment and leaving no trace and moving on, so not staying around, then you should have no problems even in England when it is illegal. So just to finish with, what would be your top three tips if you were giving somebody advice regarding wild camping? Right, the top three tips. Look early. Um, make sure you're giving yourself enough time to find that beautiful spot. Um, work out what you need from that spot could be wind protection could be flatness could be remoteness could be even a local restaurant nearby with some wi-fi signal you can tap into could be a nearby service station so you can use the bathroom whatever admire the beauty of the spot enjoy it enjoy the solitude and the kind of secret smile you get from wild camping and also make sure you leave no trace so it's available for the next person to come and enjoy once you've left. And don't geotag it either, that's another thing, because you kind of want it to be a surprise and that there's a really lovely thing about stumbling onto a beautiful spot where if you are heading somewhere directly to wild camp that someone else has recommended, that kind of can get quite spoilt very quickly. What is your most memorable experience of wild camping? Okay, I've got two, which I'm gonna deal with very briefly. So in terms of being creative, I once needed to be out of the wind in Argentina. So in Patagonia, the wind blows at 50 mile an hour and it means putting up your tent is impossible. And if you can put the tent up, you can't sleep. So I found a little storm drain underneath the road. So I put the bike down, crawled into the storm drain, rolled out my mattress, rolled my jumper up as a pillow and slept in there. And that was a really, really perfect wild camp for that night because I was out of the wind. And um, even though it did feel a bit weird sleeping in a little storm drain, but um, it was a memorable one for sure. Another one would be, for a complete opposite reason, would be in Kyrgyzstan. And me and my partner at the time, Fanola, cycled down this mountain, 2,000 metres down from the top of the pass, Alabel Pass in Kyrgyzstan, into this beautiful gorge. There was a fresh water stream running by. We put the bikes off to the side into this lovely green and shady woodland and we camped there for night and it was absolutely magic. So it was a, a real memorable spot just as, we just stumbled across this wild nature and it was one of the things that you remember forever. Yeah, that sounds absolutely idyllic. And if people want to know more about wild camping, I would imagine it is wild camping featured quite a lot in your book, Red In to Red in a Bicycle Journey Around the World. It is, yeah. I talk about some amazing places that I've wild camped and just the adventure of three years on a bike and the different camp spots and shenanigans that I might have or have got into. So uh I recommend you all check it out. It's available on Amazon and on my website, timmillikin.com. So that's been episode 31 of the Cycling Europe podcast. I'll post all the relevant links from this accommodation-themed episode of the podcast to cyclingeurope.org. Thanks to Tarva Lee, Simon, Simon and Tim for contributing to this episode. If you'd like to contribute yourself to a future episode of the podcast especially if you have something to say about a particular European country, because you live there or you cycled there quite a bit, then please do get in touch. Email podcast at cyclingeurope.org. So until the next episode of the podcast, that will be episode 32, stay safe and happy cycling.